Hello everyone. There's an outbreak of whooping cough in my country right now with hundreds of cases. Similar outbreaks happen all over the world all the time. So what exactly is whooping cough? Why should you care and what can be done about it? Whooping cough is a particularly nasty and highly contagious respiratory tract infection caused by a bacterium called Bordetella pertussis. Its main feature are these characteristic violent fits of cough. But in the beginning, this illness doesn't look any different than a common cold with uh, coryza, maybe conjunctivitis, low-grade fever or no fever, but this is just the first phase. After one to two weeks, it progresses into the next stage, the so-called paroxysmal stage, where these intense bursts of cough appear. So the person coughs for 5 to 15 seconds non-stop, during which they don't even have the time to inhale. So when they finally do manage to inhale, it sounds something like this. <gasps> right? Like they just narrowly escaped drowning or choking. This whooping sound is how this disease got its name. And these bursts of cough repeat over and over again all day and they're even worse by night. Anything can set them off. And to make matters worse, this paroxysmal stage of coughing lasts for weeks, if not months. So it's not called a 100-day cough for nothing. This sounds bad enough even for a young and otherwise fit and healthy person. So imagine what this does to an elderly person with chronic lung disease or heart disease. But by far, the most severely affected age group are infants under the age of 6 months. The overwhelming majority of hospitalizations and deaths from whooping cough happen within this age group. And it makes sense. Their narrow airways simply cannot withstand the intensity of inflammation brought upon them by infection with Bordetella pertussis. It destroys the respiratory epithelium, it produces a lot of mucus that is very hard to expectorate, so it's no wonder that the airways become narrow, the resistance to airflow skyrockets, and the work of breathing quickly becomes unsustainable. What's more, very young children don't present with these typical bouts of cough. Instead, they can just present with signs of uh, labored breathing, so dyspnea, cyanosis, or they can stop breathing altogether. My point is, they can deteriorate quite rapidly. So it's no wonder that in the pre-vaccine era, whooping cough was the deadliest childhood disease. Worse than polio, worse than meningitis, worse than scarlet fever, anything, right? But fortunately, all of this started to change in the 1940s when routine vaccination against whooping cough was introduced in the United States and some other countries. And whooping cough was all but eliminated by 1970s. But these early vaccines against whooping cough had some problems. They tended to produce unpleasant side effects, including local reactions at the injection site like uh, pain, swelling, sometimes even redness, and systemic reactions like uh, fever, drowsiness, inconsolable crying. This, of course, led to a lot of negative publicity and fear, which then caused the vaccination rates to drop significantly from time to time, and this, of course, opened the way for new, larger outbreaks. So there was an incentive to develop equally effective but less reactogenic vaccines, so vaccines with your side effects. How was this done? Well, these early vaccines were whole cell vaccines, meaning that they contained entire dead cells of Bordetella pertussis with all of their components. Now, some of these components produced, let's say, a useful inflammatory immune response that resulted in long-lasting immunity, while other components simply triggered inflammation that served no useful purpose other than to produce nasty side effects. So how do you get around this? Well, you isolate only the components that trigger this useful immune response and you leave out all the rest. So in the 1980s, acellular vaccines were introduced and they gradually replaced the old whole cell vaccines. And in the beginning, this all seemed to work very well. However, in the late 1980s and early 90s, some problems started to appear. There was a noticeable rise in the cases of whooping cough once again. The numbers were nowhere near as high as in the pre-vaccine era, but still this was a significant problem. So what was causing it? Now, you could argue that the diagnostic tests for whooping cough became more widely available and that everyone became more aware of whooping cough, fair enough, but the main reason was the fact that 
immunity from vaccination doesn't last very long, especially with acellular vaccines. Instead, it wanes over the period of four to five years. So by the time these vaccinated kids reached puberty, many of them became susceptible to infection once again. And this became very obvious once teenagers started to get sick instead of infants. Now, someone might argue, okay, who cares? They're teenagers, they're big, they're not little babies. It's not like they're going to die from whooping cough. It will be unpleasant. They will cough for a couple of weeks, okay, but they will be fine. Fair enough, they will not die, but they can still infect others. They can infect their contacts. They can infect their younger siblings, right? So this is a significant problem. How did the medical community, how did the experts respond to this? Well, whooping cough is so highly contagious that you need very high vaccination rates if you are to prevent these occasional local outbreaks. So today in most countries, we vaccinate children at the age of two months, four months, then six months, then between the ages of 12 to 18 months, and then they get another dose before they start school, between the ages of 4 and 6. But in some countries, in addition to that, it is also recommended that older children, so between the ages of 11 to 12, receive an extra dose. On top of that, adults are also advised to receive an extra dose, especially medical professionals. But what about children younger than two months? What if they get infected? Of course, they are most vulnerable. Well, in some countries, again, in the US, for example, it is also recommended that all pregnant women receive an extra dose of this vaccine in every pregnancy, preferably right at the beginning of the third trimester. The idea behind this, of course, is to protect the women because any respiratory tract infection is not a very pleasant thing in pregnancy, especially if it produces violent bursts of cough that can last for weeks or months, right? But more importantly, with this vaccination, the mothers will produce high levels of antibodies that will provide passive protection for their newborns. So, these newborns will be protected from whooping cough even before they have the chance to receive the vaccine at the age of two months. And this is why this recommendation is so important. Now, again, it is not routine in all countries, but to me personally, as an infectious disease specialist, it makes a lot of sense. So if you are not sure what are the recommendations in your country, be sure to find out because this recommendation is vital, especially when there is an outbreak. In addition to vaccination, there are other things that we can do to prevent the spread of whooping cough because some people who have been vaccinated, they will not produce very serious symptoms, but they can still be carriers of Bordetella pertussis, the cause of whooping cough, right? And if we suspect that someone is infected, we can treat them with antibiotics, preferably macrolides. Without treatment, people with whooping cough are usually contagious up to three weeks, but with treatment, we can eradicate Bordetella pertussi from their respiratory system and make sure that they don't infect others. So, we treat people who have been sick for up to three weeks, but if they have a serious predisposing condition or immunodeficiency, this can extend up to six weeks. Beyond that, antimicrobial treatment doesn't make much sense. Yes, the patient is probably still coughing, but this doesn't mean that they are still infected. The bacterium is already long gone, but the damage to their respiratory epithelium persists and they will simply need time to recover. Just be aware that if the patient is already in the paroxysmal stage, antibiotics will do very little to alleviate their symptoms, but at least they won't be contagious anymore. In addition to treatment, we can also provide post-exposure prophylaxis. So if someone was exposed to an individual with a suspected or confirmed whooping cough, we can give them antibiotics before they develop symptoms. The incubation period of whooping cough is around 7 to 10 days, but it can be as long as 3 weeks. And this is why we treat everyone who has been in contact with a sick person within the last 3 weeks. But if you want to use antibiotics wisely, and I hope that you do, first you need to have a pretty good level of certainty that this really is whooping cough. So how do you tell it apart from other similar conditions? Well, if your patient has this persistent cough that lasts for longer than two to three weeks, especially if they have these typical bursts of cough 
with inspiratory whooping or vomiting, of course, you will suspect that this is pertussis. But again, not everyone presents with these typical signs and symptoms, especially since nowadays most of us have at least a partial immunity against whooping cough, either from vaccination or previous infection or both. So if you see a patient with this persistent nagging cough, even if it doesn't come in bursts, but they have no fever and they look okay, more or less, you should suspect whooping cough, especially if they were in contact with someone who had similar symptoms and especially if whooping cough was confirmed. Speaking of which, how do you confirm it? Nowadays, by far the most popular and the most widely available test is PCR. So you have to take a nasopharyngeal sample and send it for PCR for Bordetella pertussis. If you don't know how to do that, you better leave it to someone who does, because you can't use a cotton swab, you have to use special swabs and reach the nasopharynx. Both PCR and culture are most sensitive in the first couple of weeks when the bacterial load is highest. PCR has largely replaced culture, although many expert societies recommend that you order both if you suspect whooping cough, but PCR is more convenient, it's quicker, it's more sensitive, culture takes about 7 days to complete, while PCR can be done in, in hours. Another advantage of PCR is that it can detect dead bacteria, meaning it's less affected by antimicrobial therapy. So, in most settings, PCR will be your number one method for diagnosing whooping cough. Serology is somewhat less reliable. Depending on the tests you use, there are cutoffs that are considered significant, but in general, serology is very hard to interpret, especially since most people have already been vaccinated against pertussis, so they already have the antibodies to begin with, so positive antibodies don't mean much. Maybe if you take two tests several weeks apart and you can see the antibodies rising, okay, this is an elegant proof of acute infection, but in practice this is rarely done. Of course, you don't have a couple of weeks, you have to make a decision right now. At the end of the day, vaccination is still the safest and the most effective method for preventing whooping cough. Yes, the vaccines are not perfect. Yes, the protection does wane over time, but the vaccines are still great at protecting the ones who are most vulnerable, and that is what matters. Nowadays, infants who end up in the IC or, heaven forbid, die from whooping cough are almost always unvaccinated or they are simply too young and they haven't had the time to receive the vaccines against whooping cough. So, vaccination is paramount, good coverage is paramount, and the vaccines are still our best bet against many infectious diseases, including whooping cough. Thank you for watching, good luck out there and take care.